And welcome live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Thank you very much for tuning in. You are, of course, watching The Week Ahead with myself, Diesel Wilson. But on that note, let's take a look at your headlines before we get into those top stories. Now, Defence Minister Tandi Modise says the Justice, Crime Prevention and Security Cluster is reassessing the capacity and strength of intelligence services to avoid future unrest in the country. In other news, Mineral Resources and Energy Department has announced the adjustment of fuel prices. And further Phil, Ukrainian forces remain determined to keep the Russian forces out of the country's capital, Kiev. On the sporting front, Mamelodi Sundowns beat defending champions Al Ahli in a CAF Champions League match at the Cairo International Stadium. Right now, those will look at your headlines. Uh, some of the top stories we're looking forward to on the week ahead include uh, the Defence Minister, Tandi Mudise, earlier says uh, the Justice, Crime Prevention and Security Cluster is reassessing the capacity and strength of intelligence services to avoid future unrest in the country. Now, the report of the expert panel into the 2021 July unrest, which resulted in the deaths of over 350 people, found that the police's operational planning was poor. The ministers are also re-evaluating and assessing the capacity and strength of the intelligence services to undertake surveillance and monitoring of stability in the country. The report of the expert panels on the, of, on the 2021 July unrest pointed us to several shortcomings in this work. The state security agency and crime intelligence will ensure that critical posts are filled which were left vacant by suspensions, resignations, promotions, and even death. There is a 46% improvement in the filling of vacancies between 2019-2020 and 2020-2021 financial years. The vacancies at foreign stations have also decreased significantly. A forensic investigation was initiated and a forensic, forensic investigation was initiated and a forensic investigations firm has been appointed to conduct an investigation into all malfeasance in the agency. The agency has recently dismissed about four members who have already been found guilty of fraud and corruption. Right on the back of the uh, cry of the Justice Crime Prevention and Security Cluster briefing, which wrapped up a little earlier on, perhaps to discuss the dynamics within the security cluster and uh, what we uh, foresee for the, the future of the country. Of course, uh, we're going to unpack these dynamics with Professor Barry Hanyani, who joins us for analysis again, political analyst and uh, lecturer at the uh, Northwest University. Prof, a very good afternoon to you, and thank you once again for joining us here on the ACBC. Good afternoon, Lizelle. Good afternoon to your viewers. Prof, it seems like it's been a very busy time since the State of the Nation address. Again, some of the criticisms that came through for the president involved, you know, action and implementation. And it seems after this um, briefing that we saw earlier on today, and perhaps even given the changes in the security cluster on Friday, we heard Police Commissioner Ketla Sitole, uh, you know, being dismissed. Um, his term comes to an end at the end of March. Um, perhaps the president citing that this was in the best interest for the country. And obviously, again, following the pronouncements made at the State of the Nation address. Prof, I wonder, yeah. you know, as we look at the possibilities which lie ahead, who is touted as possible replacements for the uh, position of police commissioner going forward? What, what names stand out for you as we speak? Well, Lizel, there, there are quite a few names that would stand out. The current commissioner in two pro uh, the current commissioners in two provinces, that is, Gauteng and KZN. And perhaps um, a one surprise from the outside, but coming from the ranks of subs, uh, there could be uh, uh, one surprise coming from there. But otherwise, I'd like to believe we have capable men and women in blue who can rise to the occasion and, and, and raise their right hands and say they are willing to serve. The, the, the difficulty is that 
they 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 might be aware that they are they might be walking into a very demanding daunting task and and a job overall which involves the current minister if of course he, he, he does not get a boot as well who who would from time to time uh, perhaps clash with them uh, because of personality issues because of egoistic issues as well. So, but that's, that's the nature of the job. They are there to perform. Uh, so I, 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 I'd like to believe we have a few people who, who might fill that post uh, very soon and quite well. Okay, Prof, you've, you've mentioned quite a few. Let's, you know, break it down and perhaps look at the issues in isolation. I wonder if we can first start off with um, the police commissioner and the role, uh, the track record of that position yeah. to date. Yeah. Um, perhaps yeah. we've seen that it, it doesn't look that great. Uh, there is a track record of police commissioners mm. not finishing their terms mm. upon um, coming into occupying that position. You, I mean, we can look at previous names, including uh, mm. Jackie mm. Celebi, mm. Ria Piecha, yeah. amongst others. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Who, who obviously... Um, you know, served in the role, but you wonder when you look at the precedence that has been set here, I mean, how mm, do we begin mm. to res restore trust in that regard, just given that dynamic on its own? Lisa, we, we can restore trust on the basis of putting a fresh new checks and balances, right? Starting with the idea of recruiting. I think, I think what needs to be done here, and from the minister's point of view, is to sit down and perhaps profile the kind of person who, as you rightly pointed, has, has, has more chance of surviving given past experiences of all those persons and more that you've mentioned who could not survive being in that office. So, in other words, there should be a template that should inform the ministry that any person who walks into those shoes should have the following traits, should have the following uh, credentials, which would put that person in good stead in terms of withstanding pressure, but more so uh, serving a long mile. Albeit under the disguise that at the end of the day, it comes to personal choice, whether people want to stay on, a, or, or, or on the job or not. But I think the ministry must now take charge of profiling, if needs be, uh, putting a template to say any person who who should at least turn the tide here, given the history, must have the following traits, must have the following experience, and of course that person must continue to get support within the ministry. It doesn't help to put all these instruments and mechanisms, and yet there is little coming from the ministry itself in terms of reassuring that such a particular person uh, will enjoy his job and serve the country and serve it well. Prof, you know, to add on to what you're saying then, when we look at the dynamics of the cluster, a security cluster going forward, um, mm -hmm. but given the duties mm -hmm. of then the police commissioner and the ministry itself, perhaps even the lines of interpretation and demarcation when it comes to, to the roles at large, I wonder going forward, you know, how that's also going to, to um, play out. What, what are the expectations for the incoming police commissioner who, who steps into this position then? Well, quite huge. For starters, not to repeat uh, mistakes done last year, amongst others, lack of consensus as to how to share a common uh, worldview as to whether this was an unrest, whether this was uh, anarchy unfolding, or, or it was outright criminality. You had that situation within the cluster itself uh, giving names to what we experienced, all because, one, somebody was asleep in his duty, not anticipating. Two, no warning lights were given to say there is this pending uh, anarchy, civil unrest coming, therefore prepare yourselves. And then, of course, uh, the military having not having a plan immediately on the ground for deployment and making sure that uh, they play that supportive role over and above the civil uh, security side, which would have been there initially 
to make sure that they quell the unrest. So it is those role identification and differentiation that should have come clearly, knowing what the right hand does, uh, the, the left hand more or less does the same. Mm. So, Prof, I mean, we then also saw the tensions between the minister, between Minister Kale and Police Commissioner Sitola playing mm. out. Um, obviously, with a spotlight on the working relations between the two roles then, as you've, you know, tried to um, distinguish what uh, that's going to entail, perhaps even going forward. And I think a yeah. question on, on many people's minds also is, will Minister Kale stay the course as the minister in that portfolio? I mean, will he survive yeah. this yeah. as well? We, yeah. You've spoken earlier about the issue of personality coming into play and perhaps even the management thereof. But um, we've also heard from the opposition parties like the EFF and the DA who've called for the minister, um, you know, to, to, to step down. And I wonder if this, yeah. um, you know, with the, the dismissal of the police commissioner, does it sort of exonerate him at this point, um, especially as the party also heads into, into the elective conference? Yeah, it, it somewhat does, Isel. Uh, on the basis of political strategy or political interest. I mean, if, if he is a staunch supporter, one of the lieutenants, as we call them politically, uh, in, in the circle of Mr. Ramaphosa, so he would want to keep him and say, how does he then leverage his presence uh, as well as his membership within the party which will be needed to sway numbers in KZN come the conference, as your question would, would want us to think, that in the end, it's about conference prerogatives. Will, will, will he and others become that formidable force that can at least compete head on with the so-called KZN RET? I think he can, I think he can pull strings for the president, uh, but the question would then be asked, will he then keep him after the conference? I think that permutation is anyone's guess. But what is important is that he now offers a chance to say, here are the votes from KZN. We would like you to have a second term. And on that basis, some kind of realignment of politics in KZN may be the start. Somewhere in the background, there's, there's, there's the punting of, of, of Dr. Mkise. So in a sense, you need a person like Fele to counter, to mitigate any potential comeback of Dr. Mkise into the fray and, of course, eventually the challenge to the presidency. And, and then beyond that, obviously, also looking at the challenges within the ministry itself, perhaps uh, dealing with the gaps that have come to the fore that we saw was highlighted during the July race. But we also saw issues of procurement. Um, there was PPE yeah. PP scandal yeah. where four yeah. senior management yeah. officials received yeah. indictments based on an SIE report, uh, issues of capacity, yeah. um, miscommunication amongst, you know, many other issues. And so issues rather. So when we look at the needs and gaps and the positions that need to be filled, over mm -hmm. 10,000 having left or resigned. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. is currently being highlighted? And I think in the same breath, you can't then also ignore the morale and the lack of motivation yeah. Yeah. that also yeah. exists amongst uh, staff yeah. in, that, in that portfolio yeah. and, and where they're actually at going forward. Well, it's bad news there, uh, uh, Lizelle. The scorecard doesn't look good. So any potential candidate who will take over the reins from uh, uh, Mr. Kessler Sitole would immediately need to hit the road running, address all these issues. And again, that person must not be seen to be someone who unilaterally would want to champion solutions in this case. Instead, he needs to hold hands with the minister, with the unions in particular, and all other important stakeholders as part of the social compact, including the security cluster itself, in finding solutions and hopefully long-term solutions for SUPS. SUPS seems to be uh, somewhat of the adopted baby of government, given the amount of resources, given the amount of challenges that have not been resolved over a period of time, and I think here lies an opportunity to turn the tide and make sure that this portfolio does perform well as one would expect it to be. Let's look at 
some examples of pockets of excellence then to date, uh, whether it was yeah. individual or collective. Yeah. A recent incident perhaps is the Rosettin, the uh, Rosettinville incident. Um, perhaps yeah. I could count yeah. as a feat of, of sorts. Uh, but in, in your opinion, what else stands for you, particularly given the trust deficit yeah. based on the yeah. current dynamics? Um, I would struggle, Lizelle, to find out because these would then amount to little pockets of, of excellence, you hear over social media, you guys announcing uh, two policemen, for instance, rescued a baby from human trafficking, all of that. So this will be isolated. You still need to knock, uh, get a knock off uh, uh, effect, if you want to call it that way, of registering uh, your, your, your top notch collective efforts. Uh, take, for instance, uh, heists. Um, foiling of a heist would rank amongst those. Um, I'm trying to think human trafficking, drug mm -hmm. trafficking. You need to score big on those fronts to then say, all right, to the public, we have what it takes. We have the willingness. We have trained men, hopefully. We, we have resources that we can deploy. And yes, we can keep South Africans safe from any form of incursion both domestic and international, including terrorism, by the way. So we still have a long way to reclaim that position and, of course, give pedestal to SAPS to prove itself. Prof, on a separate point in conclusion, but, you know, related perhaps to the July unrest, uh, we saw that um, trucks were central in feeding security concerns during the July unrest. Um, obviously, issues were linked to foreign nationals. There was xenophobia. And there was also the burning of, of trucks themselves. And I wonder, yeah. are there causes for concern as the strike is currently underway in KZN? What's your analysis uh, in conclusion? No, no, absolutely. There is a cause for concern. Until such time, we don't hear blockages, either because the unions are fighting uh, the, 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 the bosses or the authorities. Uh, together, we saw that sometime uh, the past few weeks being blockaded, inconvenience to other motorists. All of that should be classified as, as civil disorder. And it's up to SAPS to come up with strategies to say, do we have a workable intelligence? Do we have a workable uh, uh, response team? One that will not end up uh, creating a bloodshed or violence of some sort. At some stage within that province, we saw artists uh, blockading highways. So it is all these incidences of civil disobedience that will test the might of SAPS. And any commissioner who walks into that needs to take cognizance of this and make necessary arrangements to prepare for any eventuality along these lines. Prof, that's where we're going to leave the conversation. Thank you very much for your time once again. Political analyst and Northwest University lecturer Barry Hanyane, Professor Barry Hanyane, rather. Looking ahead at the security cluster dynamics unfolding in the country, the implications thereof for the country, of course, as police commissioner Ketla Sitole was dismissed on Friday. And again, also promise, uh, follows promises made by the president during his SONA address on the 10th of February. But again, also early on today, a, secure, a justice crime prevention security cluster briefing was held in which some of these issues discussed today were highlighted. Let's take a quick ad break and continue with more news on the week ahead. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You are watching The Week Ahead with myself, Liesl Wilson. In other news, now the price of petrol will hit a record high next week. Mineral Resources and Energy Department says both petrol grades will increase by 1 rand 46 cents a litre. And it pushes the price of 93 octane to 21 rand 35 cents and uh, 95 octane to 21 rand 60 cents. Diesel increases by 1 rand 48 cents per litre and illuminating paraffin by 1 rand 28 cents a litre. All these increases for March are mainly due to the rising oil price, of course, following the conflict with Russia and the Ukraine. 
In other news, truck drivers affiliated to the All Truck Drivers Forum in Allied South Africa have embarked on a stay away. They say that no truck will be moving across the country. They are protesting against the hiring of foreign nationals in the trucking industry and say that the operating operations rather of trucks is not a critical skill and uh, wants this job to be reserved for South Africans only. The truckers are expected to march to the bargaining council offices in Peter Maritzburg and Johannesburg tomorrow to deliver the memorandum. Right, uh, let's take a look at uh, news further afield with the spotlight on the Ukraine-Russia conflict. The United States, Britain, Europe and Canada have moved to block Russia's bank's access to the SWIFT international payment system as part of more sanctions against Moscow. Now, European Commission President Ursula, Ursula rather, von der Leyen says cutting Russian banks out of the SWIFT system will stop them from conducting most of their financial transactions worldwide and effectively block Russian exports and imports. We are resolved to continue imposing massive costs on Russia. Costs that will further isolate Russia from the international financial system and our economies. In coordination with President Biden, President Macron, Bundeskanzler Scholz and Prime Minister Draghi, as well as Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Johnson, we considered a significant tightening of our international response. The European Union and its partners are working to cripple Putin's ability to finance his war machine. I will now propose to EU leaders the following measures. First, we commit to ensuring that a certain number of Russian banks are removed from SWIFT. This will ensure that these banks are disconnected from the international financial system and harm their ability to operate globally. Meanwhile, a defiant Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, said the capital Kiev remained in Ukrainian hands. Ignoring weeks of warnings from Western leaders, Russian President Vladimir Putin launched the invasion of Ukraine on Thursday from the north, east and south. It's an assault that threatens to upend Europe's post-Cold War order. Ukrainian soldiers were seen with guns on a flyover near Kyiv's main westward thoroughfare. Burnt vehicles, believed to be Russian, shells and bullets littered the overpass. After a night of airstrikes, there were some signs of panic in the center of Kyiv, with groups of people carrying suitcases seen in the streets. Local residents described the night of terror. There was this roar in the middle of the night. We got up and went to the cellar. The roaring sound continued for an hour. That's it. We stayed another hour. And then at sunrise, we went up home. Former boxing world heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko issued an impassioned desperate plea to the world on Saturday for intervention to stop Russia's invasion of his native Ukraine. Just today, civilians were shot by the rockets with special operations, civilians getting killed. And it's happening in the heart of Europe. There is no time to wait. You need to act now to stop Russian aggression. Please get into action now. Don't wait. Act now. Stop this war. Vladimir's brother and Kiev's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, said there was currently no major Russian military presence in Kiev, but added that saboteur groups were active. He said the metro system is now serving only as a shelter for citizens and trains have stopped running. Another news, the World Food Programme has launched investigations into fresh allegations of sex for food against local officials in Mozambique. The World Food Programme says it has met with local officials for preliminary discussions about the situation. 
Now, recipients of food aid in northern Mozambique have told the UN that some community leaders involved in distributing the relief have been demanding sexual favours. Cabo Delgado province has been at the centre of an insurgency since 2017, but the conflict has displaced thousands of people. Right, and that's where we're going to leave it for you today. Once again, it's been an absolute pleasure wishing you all the best for the week ahead. But from myself, Liesl Wilson and the Week in the Head team, until next time, take care. It's goodbye for now.